Hey, today we're going to look at Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 46. Jackson read this passage uh, just a moment ago. So go ahead and find it in your Bible or light it up in your app and hold your place there. But I want to take you back in time to May 1965. It was in Lewiston, Maine, and that's when a photographer by the name of Neil Leifer uh, captured this iconic photo of Muhammad Ali standing over Sonny Liston, uh, after a knockout punch just two minutes into the first round. Now, uh, Muhammad Ali was probably the most outspoken athlete there ever was. Would you agree? Uh, his boxing career spoke for itself, but he had a whole lot more to, to add to it. He'd say things like, you know, float like a butterfly, sting like a what? Like a bee, okay? He said things like, if you even dream of beating me, you'd better wake up and apologize. <laughs> I like that. And this, this is one of my favorite. If my mind can conceive it and my heart can believe it, then I can achieve it. But probably his most famous one was what? I am the what? I am the greatest. And then he had added to that, I said that even before I knew that I was. Well, you know, today we're going to take a look at what true greatness really is, uh, starting with a special request made by James and John, two of the, the, the 12 disciples of Jesus. Uh, James and John were, were brothers, and just like Simon, later called Peter, and his brother Andrew, all these guys were fishermen before they were disciples. And, and so Jesus nicknamed James and John the Sons of Thunder. It sounds like a wrestling team, doesn't it? Sons of Thunder. That's because when they were going through Samaria on their way to Jerusalem, uh, they encountered a problem with the, the villagers in Samaria. They were looking for a place to stay, and uh, there was just opposition uh, because of the prejudice that had divided Jews and Samaritans for forever. And so when James and John saw this, they asked Jesus, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? <laughs> so, sons of thunder, good name, right? And I'm sure there were other times they lived up to that nickname. Well, what was the special request that the sons of thunder made of Jesus. It's in Mark 10, look at it again, verses 35 through 37. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. And they replied, well, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You know, it kind of sounds like they want a blank check, you know. just uh, Some people pray like that. They call it boldness. It feels more like arrogance. Uh, John Piper had this to say about the request. He says, James and John get one thing right here and most everything else wrong. They're right when they say that Jesus is destined for glory, and that's a good thing to be right about. There are some people who are not yet right about that, and here's how you can tell. If you know that a company stock is going to take off and go through the roof, you buy that stock and not the competitors. If you know this building is going to stand after the storm and no others, well, you get in this building and not the others. And if you know that Jesus is going to reign in glory over every rival, then you follow Jesus and not his rivals. And Piper says, some are not following Jesus, and so they don't have it right yet about his glory. They're not as far along as James and John. Well, you know, you could look at their requests and say, these guys, they were just, man, they were just confident that they were on the winning team, and they just wanted a, a seat at the table. Uh, but Jesus shuts them down. In verse 38, he says this, You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? Well, what cup is he talking about? In the Garden of Gethsemane, remember his prayer? Okay, prior to his arrest and crucifixion, he's praying so hard that he sweats drops of blood. The weight of the sin was, of the world was about to be placed on him. And so he asked God the Father if there was any way to take this cup from me. He was talking about the cup of his suffering and death. But what about the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with? Well, in Luke chapter 12, verse 50, Jesus said this, I have a baptism to undergo, 
and what constraint I'm under until it's accomplished. Well, we know he was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, so he's not talking about a do-over. He's not talking about a double dip and doing that again. What's he talking about? Well, Jesus saw his death not only as a bitter cup to drink, but also as an immersion, a baptism in suffering. So he's saying to James and John, my path to glory is through suffering and death. And so if you want that honor, then you must follow me in my suffering and death. You know, it reminds me of something else Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. And then he says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So Jesus asked James and John, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And it's no surprise what their answer was. I mean, the sons of thunder said, we can. (laughs) And they had enough swagger. They were probably thinking, doesn't he know who we are? (laughs) Come on, we're the greatest. We float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. You know, it reminds me of something of Peter when Jesus revealed to Peter that Satan would sift him like wheat. And Peter just, he couldn't believe it. He said, Lord, even though all these other guys tap out, not me. You can count on me to be with you to prison and to death. But then when Jesus is arrested and carried off to be beaten and and crucified, Peter follows, but Scripture says he followed at a distance. And then later, what does he do? He denies Jesus three times, just like Jesus said he would. You know, sometimes, just like James and John and and Peter, sometimes we can let our boldness turn into arrogance. And sometimes we let our surrender turn into a swagger. But if we're going to be great in the kingdom of God, we've got to have the arrogance and the swagger gospeled out of us if God's going to really be able to use us. Well, after explaining what they were asking, Jesus went on to say to them in verses uh, 39 and 40, he says, you will drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. In other words, my father has already made the seating chart, and you cannot get an upgrade no matter who you are or who you know or how many frequent flyer miles you may have. Uh, and when the rest of the disciples heard this conversation, Scripture says they were, man, they were indignant. And Jesus used this moment for a beautiful teaching opportunity for his disciples. In Mark chapter 10, verses 42 through 44, he says this. It says this, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. So Jesus redefines greatness. He says there is a difference in the world system and God's system. True greatness comes by serving. It's not about positional authority. It's not about the survival of the fittest. It's by serving. And so Jesus said that he came that we might have life and have it to the full. So this life is in Jesus, and this life in Jesus, the first is last, and last is first. Man, that sounds like fuzzy math, okay? It's like it's countercultural. But if we're going to be fulfilled, Scripture tells us the people who are the happiest and the most fulfilled are the ones who are living for something greater than themselves. Uh, In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25, it says, A generous person will prosper, and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. So, you want to really be happy? All right, start serving others. 
Start giving your life away. That's how you tap into true greatness and true uh, happiness. Uh, in the series Essentials for Life, I talk about our obsession with quality of life and what we think it looks like in session one. I asked a friend of mine uh, to share his perspective from his professional experience. He happens to be a psychiatrist. So are you guys ready for some group therapy? Okay, let's do it. Here's Paul. As a psychiatrist, I see every day the human tendency to compare with others, to find value in feeling that I stack up or measure up in comparison to other people, their, their good looks, their intelligence, um, productivity. Unfortunately, when we compare ourselves with others, um, we are likely to do one of two things, both of which is a problem. We focus too much on our shortcomings, which leaves us feeling less than, or we tend to overlook our shortcomings and focus on the things that we excel in, which can leave us feeling more than others. The problem with both of those uh, determinations is that it actually makes me feel separate rather than connected. We're all a mix of awesome and awful, and when we are able to be authentic, to live from our true heart, then we have the ability to connect with people both in their strengths and in their weaknesses, and to feel loved both in my times of glory and in my times of being absolutely gross. It's the greatest thing to have relationships in which I can be just as I am, to show up in a authentic way without feeling that I have to measure up. I actually grew up in a church that was very Bible-centered, but also very much concerned about believing and behaving right. Uh, there was a clear standard that if you were to measure up to it, you could feel secure in your relationship with God and with others. But if you fell short, mm, might be out of luck. I struggled with that because at times I felt like, well, I'm doing pretty good. And at times I knew I was falling way short of that ideal. Later, thankfully, in my desperation to um, resolve that tension, I learned that the life that God has for us is not about religion, but about relationship. And I learned that, um, as Tyr said, it's, it's that being connected with life um, that is found in Jesus that allows us to really grow into who we're created to be. We are made in the image of God who is love, and so we are wired for connection. And so when I found the ability to invite God to live in me um, just as I was, regardless of my uh, correct beliefs or behavior, that's when I began to realize not only um, that profound sense of acceptance with God, but also the ability to be truly authentic with other people and not be worried about measuring up or being judged. I think in my own journey and, and, and with the people I work with, it's that feeling of disconnection that leads to a feeling of being unworthy and unlovable. Not only do we need to have that connection with God, we also need people around us to um, give and receive support from us. And we need an avenue for investing who we are into the lives of others. It turns out that the happiest people on the planet are people who give of themselves, who volunteer, who serve in some way. The research validates what Jesus said all along, that it's more blessed to give than to receive. So we are made for love. We're made in the image of God who is love. And so we are wired for connection. And when we stay connected to Him, to those around us and to the place that we have to serve in the world, we have that quality of life that Jesus offers. So Jesus wraps up his lesson on true greatness in verse uh, 45. He says, for even the son of man, referring to himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus refers to himself as son of God and son of man. 
Well, Son of God refers to his deity, Son of Man, his humanity. And the Bible makes it clear he was both divine and human. Most of the time, he used the, fr the term Son of Man. Okay, it was a common phrase. Uh, it, it, it simply meant human being, so it wasn't a provocative title uh, to most. He didn't go around saying, hey, I'm here, I'm the Messiah, I'm the greatest. He didn't do that, okay? He was very careful uh, to steer a very narrow course in disclosing his identity until the time was right, okay? But to those who had ears to hear, Son of Man referred to this exalted role in the redemption story in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, in Daniel's vision, verses 13 and 14, it says this, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is everlasting, dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now, later when Jesus was on trial and they asked him, are you the Christ, the Son of the living God? At this point, he answered, I am. And you will see the Son of Man coming with great power and glory. And so he openly confesses his deity at the point when he knew he's going to be crucified. So when James and John asked this special request, we want to sit to your right and your left when you, you know, sit in glory, he redefines greatness, but then he said a very radical thing to his disciples. He said that he, the exalted Son of Man, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I see two things in this, okay? The first thing is we need to see the example of Jesus. We're followers of Jesus, all right, so we need to figure out what do we need to follow, okay? What, what patterns, what, how, what is he modeled for us? As we read his story in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see this compelling example to follow. Uh, at the end of his last supper with his disciples, Jesus washes their feet. And, uh, you know, they, they objected to it. Uh, Peter objected out loud. He didn't understand what was happening. But then in John 13, verses 14, through 17, Jesus said, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I say to you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So he gives us this example to follow, and he promises a blessing for anybody who would follow. There's another example of Jesus that we're encouraged to follow. It's, it's in Philippians, Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, chapter 2, uh, verse 5 through 8 says this. It says, in your relationships with, with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, so Jesus could have leveraged his position and claimed an exemption, but Philippians says he didn't do that. He didn't use it to his own advantage, but he humbled himself, and he took on the nature of a servant. You know, in Isaiah uh, chapters 42 and 43, the Messiah is described as a what? A servant, a suffering servant. So he's just fulfilling all of this. Humility, he humbled himself. Well, that can be tricky, okay? It doesn't mean that we're passive or a pushover. Jesus was not passive. He was not a pushover. But the flip side of that, confidence can also be tricky. Sometimes it turns into arrogance. Uh, like another thing Muhammad Ali said, he said, it's hard to be humble when you're as great as I am. <laughs> and some of you like to know, where can I get that shirt? I'd wear that. Well, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed that God would take this cup, you know, from him, uh, the cup of his suffering and death. But then he prayed, 
yet not my will, but yours be done. So just like Philippians says, he humbled himself by becoming obedient unto death, even death on a cross. So he not only gives us this, this inspiring example of humility, we have this incredible example of extreme and self-sacrificial obedience. There's something else in Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, there's that word again, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now, we see that in Jesus, whether it's in, uh, in, in uh, the way he treated Zacchaeus, the tax collector that everybody else hated, uh, or the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well who had gone through five husbands, living with a guy who was her husband, yet he related with her. He offered her living water. Uh, we see it uh, when he's a guest in Simon the Pharisee's house and a woman from the city, a prostitute, comes in. She begins to wash his feet by wetting them with her tears. Simon the Pharisee, his religious friends, man, they were appalled by that. But Jesus didn't care. He was always tuned in to the needs and the interest of others, the outcasts. So we need to be sure that our radar <laughs> is pointed in the right direction. That it's not pointed to us, but it's pointed outward, and it's tuned to the interest and the needs of others. You know, I think all of us, man, I could use more practice in learning how to value others above myself, more training in being sensitive and attentive to the needs and interests of others. Uh, you know, comic books will use uh, speech bubbles and thought bubbles to tell a story. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Okay, well, what if I could just snap my fingers and all of our thought bubbles just magically appeared for everybody to read? <laughs> what would your thought bubble say? Would it, would it say something like, how can I help? Or, leave me alone. Or, after you. Or, get out of my way. Or, I really want to hear what you have to say. Or, I wish you'd just shut up and listen. <laughs> or how about this? Is this your thought bubble? This is who I am. Deal with it. <laughs> you know, an underdeveloped servant or a person who has the gift of hospitality, but it's an underdeveloped gift of hospitality, they're not really thinking about what people really need. They're serving people, but they just want to do things for them that they like with no attention to, is this something they really need? Then they get their feelings hurt if the person they're serving doesn't rave about it. So they're not really serving them. They're serving themselves. Are you all with me? Does that make sense? You see, a true servant is a student who's always learning how to identify the interests and needs of others. Parents are students of kids. And every kid's different. Uh, wives are students of their husbands. Husbands are students of their wives. Uh, guys, the Bible tells us as husbands to live with our wives in an understanding way. It doesn't tell us to understand our wives. Thank you, God. But it tells us to live with them in an understanding way as students. And every season of life is different. So guess what? School is always in session. But if we're always expecting others to adjust to us, Man, we need to go back to school. And look, as students going to school, we're not going to get A's in all of our classes. Some of them are going to have to take over again and again. And so we ought to have more grace with each other because we're all students. We're all learning this. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I communicate for a living, but sometimes in the real world, especially with my wife, the things I'm thinking don't come out right in my mouth. All right? I don't know how long that Dan and I have been married. We were living in the Dallas-Fort Worth area at the time. I was traveling a lot. I did an event somewhere in West Texas. And so I get up on Monday morning to drive back, and, man, it's dark, and, but then the sun starts coming up, and the only music on the radio is country western. And so I hear this classic Randy Travis song, you know. And so I just started welling up with emotion for how much I love my wife. And so I call her as the sun is coming up, and I'm having this moment, and I start singing. I'm going to love you forever, forever and ever, amen. And then there was silence. And then she said, I will call you back later. 
<laughs> As it turns out, she, she was running a little bit late to leave for work, okay? And so I didn't know that, okay? And so school's always in session. There was another time I was trying to communicate how much I loved her, and I just couldn't imagine, you know, how my love could be any greater. And so I was trying to communicate that, but instead what I said was to her, I don't think I can love you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Now, she knew what I was trying to say, but man, I mean, she just let me have it. Okay, so we're students. We're always learning, always trying to tune in to the interests and the needs of others. So three things from the example of Jesus, humility, obedience, sensitivity. Humility keeps us teachable and respectful of others. It keeps us teachable. Hey, how do you do with correction? When someone corrects you, how do you respond? What's your thought bubble say? Or what does your speech bubble say? What's coming out of your mouth? You know, someone said, it isn't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just isn't so. <laughs> and so we need to be teachable. You know, good teachers are teachable. Good coaches are coachable. Always, whatever season of life. Obedience is evidence of genuine faith. It's hearing and doing. Remember, faith without works is what? Dead. So obedience is evidence of, of genuine faith. And sensitivity tunes us in to the needs of others. We look for ways to affirm others and help them feel valued, just like Jesus did. So he said, the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. We see his example, but there's something else we see. We see the provision of Jesus. The disciples didn't get it yet, but Jesus was saying, are y'all ready for this? He was saying, I didn't come for you to serve me. I came to serve you. Now, his service to them and us starts with our need for a Savior. I think the angel got it best with what the angel said to the shepherds out in the field, tending their flocks, Luke chapter 2, verse 10, he says, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. And then he says, Today in the town of David, listen to this, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. You see, Jesus serves us by first saving us. If this was the Christmas season, if it was Christmas in August, we could say this. Now, this is radical. Hold on. <laughs> we could say this. We are the reason for the season. Now, don't run out screaming heresy, and it's okay to keep putting up your yard signs that say Jesus is, because that's true, okay? But folks, think about it with me for a moment. Why do we celebrate the Christmas season? It's because God initiated something that we desperately needed. We needed a Savior. So to, unto us, a Savior is born. Unto us, a son is given. Unto us, a child is born. Jesus serves us by first saving us. We, first and foremost, need a Savior. But he also serves us by providing everything we need to fulfill the mission that we're given. In John 15, he tells his disciples, bear fruit to prove that you're my disciples. But then he says, the only way you're going to be able to bear fruit is to stay connected to the vine. John 15, verse 4 says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. In verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, if you walk through a vineyard, you're not going to hear, you're not going to hear branches straining to bear grapes. You won't hear that. If they're connected to a healthy vine, guess what? They produce lots of grapes. Now, that should calm our fears about serving. Because whatever mission God has given us to fulfill. He provides everything we need. All we have to do is stay connected to the vine, which is Jesus. 
You know, to revise one of my favorite Muhammad Ali sayings, I said it a moment ago, if my mind can conceive it, my heart can believe it, then I can achieve it as long as I stay connected to the vine, which is Jesus. You know, if we really understand the example and the provision of Jesus, man, how can we just live with a, hey, just do what's required attitude, just, just do what I have to, how can we just get by? I mean, shouldn't it motivate us to, to want to give our all? I mean, Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 says, Whatever you do, whether in, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So whatever you do, the way you do your schoolwork, your career work, uh, your relationships with others, the text you send, whatever you do, ask yourself this question. Can I put the name of Jesus on that? Can I put the name of Jesus on that? Whatever you do in word or deed, he's going to give us all we need to fulfill the mission. So do it, man, do it with great gusto and excitement because you want to do it in a way that honors him. You know, sometimes our idea of serving God is limited <laughs> to attending a Sunday gathering that we call a service. You know, and, and if we're not careful, uh, we can become these passive observers, you know, kind of, kind of like an audience just watching, watching a show, you know, just kind of auditing the class. But Jesus has something entirely different in mind, and he lays it all out in the parable of the sheep and the goats. Now, many of us are familiar with this. It is a beautiful uh, parable and principle. And so I'm going to read most of it. So hang on. Ready? In Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse uh, 31, it says this, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. And uh, kind of what James and John were thinking, we want to be there. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on the right, the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Verse 37, it says, Then the righteous will answer him, But Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? And Lord, when did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And then Jesus says in uh, verse 40, he says, The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you've done for me. That'd be great if we could stop there and celebrate, right? But we got to deal with the goats. So verse 41, then he'll say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his, and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they also will answer, but Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger? or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you. And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did, did not do, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now, I know that if most of us saw someone who was actually physically dying of hunger or thirst, man, we'd step up and help. I, I believe that. If we have that much compassion, we'd do that. But what about those who are socially, emotionally, and spiritually hungry and thirsty? What about those who are broken and need healing? What about the strangers that God crosses our path with, even brings into our church? You know, we can't be best friends with everyone, but we must be friendly to everyone, right? 
Everybody listen carefully. Everybody, ready? Is your circle of friends so tight that anybody new just bounces off of it? I was a student pastor in my early 20s, and this message of not to be served but to serve just really impacted me through my college years. And so I knew, man, we want this to be true of our students. And so I had a leadership family, and so I taught them this principle, and we had a plan to uh, implement it. Our, our church drew from five different high schools, but our church was pretty much one-dimensional. I mean, we had mo most of the students were the students who occupied more pages in the yearbook, if you know what I'm saying. They were popular, they were pretty, they were the, the cheerleaders, the football players. We had a, a state champion wrestler there. Their parents were either middle or upper uh, level management. That's what our church looked like. But as we began to do events outside of our church in the community, we began to pull in students who didn't look anything like that. But we were ready, okay? I had trained our leadership family that we were training our students that if somebody new came in that very week, either one of our adult leaders or myself, we would get some of our regular students and we would invite them to go with some of these new students somewhere, whether it's the mall or go to a ball game or something, because we wanted them to feel connected. I trained our leadership family to actually show up and take photos of, of students who were, you know, at uh, ball games or recitals or even an after-school job. I kind of trained them to be stalkers. And then I said, and then just send the picture saying, hey, saw you, so proud of you, you know, looking forward to seeing you this week. And they did that for our regulars. They did that for the new students. But we weren't really moving along as fast as we needed to. And I realized, oh, okay, as much as we're trying with our leadership family, as much as I'm trying, their parents aren't doing it. So I had a parent meeting. And I discovered most of their parents, their circle was pretty tight. They'd had the same friends forever. And while they may pray for the lost, they didn't know any lost people's names because they weren't a part of their life. Parents, listen very carefully. Our children will leave with what we have lived out at home. I taught our leadership family and I taught our parents. I'm not saying that we control their social life. I'm not saying that, but we must influence their social life. And when they're planning something, we say, hey, have you thought about this person? What about this person? Is this the kind of thing you can pull somebody in who's not connected? Are y'all with me here? Does this make sense? The big lesson from the parable of the sheep and goats is this, hold on to your seats. We're not serving Jesus unless we're serving others. As you've done it to the least of these, the ones who are broken, the ones who are outcast, the ones who are not connected, as you've not done it unto them, you haven't done it unto me. Sometimes, sometimes we overthink it. Uh, it's not that complicated. There are opportunities in our church, outside our church, at school, at our jobs, in our neighborhood. Uh, it doesn't have to be a ministry, like a ministry label. <laughs> it doesn't have to have a labeled ministry to, for it to actually be a ministry. Just pay attention, radar up, tune to the other's needs, then step in and be encouraging and affirming, assigning values to others. We've got the example and the provision of Jesus to be humble, obedient, and sensitive. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, give his life as a ransom for many. You want to be great? All right. Be a servant of all.